welcome. We are gathered here today because we are spiritual, but not like religious, you know? I don't believe in organized religion, except for Eastern religion, which I am interested in. It's just like deeper Do we believe in a God with a capital G? Maybe, maybe not. We haven't decided yet. But tell me that when you look at a sun satin over a hill, you don't feel a connection to something greater. I believe in an energy, ooh, that connects us, binds us together, and it's vibrating and stuff. You know what I mean? I get it. Now, everyone open your Twitter feeds to at Deepak Chopra. Our innermost awareness is a portal to divinity. That is so vague, but I know exactly what he means. Jacob. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I would like to read a passage from the moleskin, I write ideas in when I'm stoned. What if God isn't a he? What if he is a she or a deer? Hear me out. I light this in remembrance of the first time that I did mushrooms. Yeah, dude. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for sharing with us everything you remember from your liberal arts degree. Take it away, Melissa. I don't believe in hell and heaven, but I'm on the fence about reincarnation. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you for joining me today. It is so nice to talk to intelligent individuals who can rationally see that science hasn't figured it all out. Yeah, we get you. Now, if you'll all open your meditation apps on your phone and set it to 15 minutes, but first, let's all give each other a hug and let the physics of love clean your chakras. Oh, those are some good hugs. Oh, what a nice hug over here. You two hug back there. Come here. Well, good morning and welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. And if this is your first time, I'm so, so sorry. Uh, we are going to continue on a series that we started off a couple of weeks ago months ago, I don't know where we're at right now, but it's called Kingdoms Come, and it's this idea about world religions. But not just world religions, but also uh, different philosophies and, and, and values as well, too. Now, when I used to teach this series, and again, this is many, many, many years ago, I would go through almost every world religion, but really, it's not that important uh, to do so anymore, because what we're going to encounter, who we're going to encounter, the ideas we're going to encounter, it's a little bit different than what it used to be. And so, even, for example, some of the uh, one of the cults that we looked at, Mormonism. There's only 16 million members. You're gonna, you'll have more likelihood of running into a, a, another type of worldview than you will a Mormon, except for Will, who seems to like to hang out with him a lot. But apart from that, uh, like, like it, it, was, it was more of a test of how we view truth and what we look at it. Let's just recap what we talked about last week. So remember I said to you that my premise for this series is to approach every idea as a hypothesis. What's a hypothesis? It's an assumption you want to prove. And from there, we get to kind of extrapolate and say, does it work or does it not work? Now, why this is interesting to me is because for the longest time, Christians have been on the defense because people have said stuff like, well, religions are the reason for war. Or, you know, religion has caused more harm that if we just got rid of religion and we were just you know, secular or atheist, and then a true utopia would unfold. And again, this is a hypothesis. But as we've, we've looked at it a couple weeks back, as we actually get to test this hypothesis and say, is this actually true? So last week, we looked at this idea about the New Age movement and really some of the ideas behind it. But what I thought was really important about this, and I want to say thank you for the conversations and the emails, because obviously this one hit a little closer to home in regards to, like, when we look at what we believe, it's so easy for us to kind of slip into um, using language or ideas that are really not biblical. 
right? So remember we looked at this poll that 61% of professing Christians held an idea that really isn't founded in biblical uh, understanding, but it's actually in a more of a New Age context. Remember I said to you last week that cults offer certainty in uncertain times. So when you look at the rise of cults during history, you're going to notice that during tumultuous times, during times of uncertainty, they pop up. Why? Because a cult leader walks up and says, guess what? You can't trust anybody. You can't trust these organizations. You can't trust this. But I have special revelation. I have the truth. And I was like, okay. And for some individuals, this really resonates with them. But with the New Age movement, it offers peace in chaotic times. right? So the New Age movement had purports itself to be this uh, wellness, mindfulness, whatever phraseology you want to look at it. But it's like in the midst of this storm, in the midst of this whole uh, time of unrest, you can find peace. You can find tranquility. And, and again, just so you know, that is very, very attractive because many people feel the sense of anxiety and anxiousness in the world, and rightfully so, especially over what we've experienced. And I said, but if you take this to a, its logical conclusion, remember, every idea is a hypothesis. If God is impersonal, right, which is the, very ba- the premise of the New Age movement, then your lot in life, your suffering, is because of your own choices. And this is where I, I, I really push back on individuals or individuals, uh, as, a, as our uh, pastor said this morning. I really push back when they, when they kind of talk about this idea as, as loving. It's not loving to leave somebody in their suffering. It's not loving to see human trafficking take place and say, well, that's your lot in life. It's not loving to be able to kind of look at someone and say, you don't have any human rights. That's not loving, right? That is absolutely cold calculating. And when you look at this idea of new, the New Age movement, when you take it out to its logical extension, you realize, and remember, we looked at the teachings of Buddha last week in the sense of saying a person's lot in life, their suffering is, is part of their journey. Now, just understand something. I think there's actually some truth to that because suffering is a part of us that when we are experiencing it, God has our attention. I know individuals that when they're going through times of loss of relationship, loss of uh, uh, finances, loss of health, guess what? They are more aware, more attuned to God. And I think that's great. But to say to somebody, well, I I recognize your suffering. I recognize your long life, but I'm not going to do anything about it. Because you made choices in your previous life to be where you're at. And if I alleviate that, you're going to go through and suffer in the next life. So again, you see where we take this idea, this hypothesis, and we we kind of, we bring it all the way out. We wrapped up by looking at the passage from Ephesians chapter 2. Now, I I try to bookend as much as possible these series in Scripture, because we don't really deal with a lot of Scripture when we're looking at the actual ideas themselves. But what's interesting to me is that I, I love the fact that one of the things we have to realize as Christ followers, one of the things that the Bible reveals to us, is not an impersonal God, but a personal God. It's not just simply a set rules of how to be a good person or behavioral modification. It's a relationship. And like all relationships, it's messy. Like all relationships, there is nuance and there's, there's conversations to be had in that. So that's kind of what we looked at last week. This morning, we are, uh, we are second to last of wrapping up this series. And um, if you follow us on Instagram and or Facebook, the question we asked yesterday was, are you an authentic Christian? If I said to you, are you an authentic Christian? For the most part, people will say yes. But let's test that hypothesis. Because there is actually a way to test it, but it's an uncomfortable question. right? Because everybody likes to think that they are absolutely following what God wants for their lives. But again, we have to say to ourselves, is that actually true? Uh, buckle up. This morning's going to be fun. Um, while, bi- while biblical literalism has long been held as the most dominant method of interpreting scripture among evangelicals, results of a new poll released by Gallup show that fewer than half of evangelicals and born-again Christians believe that the Bible should be taken literally. Now, just pause here for a second. Historically, evangelicalism is this idea or this phrase or this label that emerged after mainline churches began to change how they approach the Bible. And so evangelicals, which was actually a really kind of a, uh, a, a, a change from uh, fundamental, fundamentalists is the term that used to be applied, right? The fundamentalist was the idea of like the fundamentals of the Bible. But then, of course, the media gets a hold of it, 
and starts using it. So then we change, okay, we're going to change the name to evangelicals. Now the me media's got a hold of that one, and I don't know what the next iteration is going to be. But it's like we, we, are, we are trying to kind of outpace people's bad idea of what, what it might be, and I understand that. But really what we're seeing here is more and more people who would say, yes, I am a Christ follower, but the Bible, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm not 100% sure if it's true. A uh, couple articles I want to share with you this morning. Uh, the splintering of the evangelical soul. I, I, sh I shared this one before. I'm just going to use it as, as a kind of a jumping off point. But uh, Timothy uh, Dalrymple was the editor of Christianity Today. Uh, Christianity Today, I, f I, for the most part, really enjoy their articles. Um, I think they're very, uh, they have more of an intelligent approach to Christianity, which I appreciate. But was something that Timothy Dalrymple really brought up, and this is post-pandemic, is that evangelicalism is being, sp is being fractured or splintered. This is what he says. What held the movement together historically was not only a shared set of moral and theological commitments, but a broadly simil similar view of the world and common sources of information. Now, why this is important is because evangelicals, for the most part, agreed on one thing, one thing only. The Bible is true. But that's no longer the case anymore. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about evangelicalism as more of a political label. There are people who might identify as, uh, as, as evangelical, but don't even believe in the Bible. Why? Because it's now seen as this, like, I, I vote this, I live this, I believe in that, and, and you know, this is what I think about immigration and taxes, right? It's become a political idea, and it's kind of lost its, its moorings on this. And so evangelicalism is no longer like this. Somebody else took, uh, a guy by the name of Michael Graham took uh, Timothy Dalrymple's idea of the splintering of Christianity, and he categorized Christians into six categories. See if you can identify which one you might fall into. So the first category, and again, it's a, it starts off at a spectrum, and, and if you want to use a, a way of looking at it, far right, okay? And then we're going to get to the other side, okay? So the first group he calls is the neo-fundamentalist evangelical. The neo-fundamentalists are those who have deep concerns about both political and theological liberalism. There is some overlap and co-belligerency with Christian nationalism. So a lot of times the people that you see... Um, storming the Capitol, per se, or, or uh, other things that you would look at America and kind of go, oh, please stop doing that. Um, this would be the group of Christians who would be very pro-politics po and religion together, right? So he would say, this is one category of them. The second one is one more people are, 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 uh, or are more familiar with, is mainstream, mainstream evangelical. The emphasis for this group is on the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Concerning threats within the church, they share some concern for the secular rights influence on Christianity. So mainstream evangelicalism started off this idea, and the word evangelical comes from this idea of evangelizing. Right? So evangelicalism was based upon this idea of the Great Commission, that our, our, our job as Christ followers is to go out and to spread the gospel to the world. I would think that might be a bit of a... A misapplication because while we spread the gospel, we've got to disciple those behind us, right? And so we have a kind of a mile wide, but a you know couple of inches deep Christianity, well Western Christianity. The next group he says is neo evangelical, people who would see themselves as global evangelicals and are doctrinally evangelicals with some philosophy of ministry differences, but no longer use the term evangelical in some circumstances in the American context as the term as an identifier has evolved into more political than theological. And I think many people would kind of have moved from mainstream to this one. Okay? Now, the first three categories would be, uh, according to Michael Graham, would be, you know, these are still Christians. These are still people we would identify as Christians. And these are people who may uh, attend at church, Christmas, Easter, and other holidays, and or maybe once a month. So that would be this grouping. The next grouping gets a little bit more uh, interesting. So the next group, is he would say, is post-evangelical. He says, people who have fully left evangelicalism from a self-identification standpoint and reject the evangelical label, uh, yet are still church and likely still agree with the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. So the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, believe it or not, are these two ideas that have been kind of the fundamentals of mainline churches, plus also uh, kind of a nod by more uh, Western evangelicals, Protestants as well. De-churched, but with some Jesus. Uh, people who have, <laughs> almost feel like kind of a Starbucks order, right? Uh, people who have left the church, but still hold to some Orthodox Christian beliefs. Okay, and again, this is a group of people who would not say, I don't attend church, I, I stay at home, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian, and, and all that kind of stuff. And so he would call those people de-churched. 
And the final category is de-churched and deconverted. People who have left the church and are completely deconverted with no vestial uh, Christian beliefs. I love that vestial. It's like it used to be an organ I used, but now I don't need it anymore, right? So, so this is the six categories of Christianity. I would have actually put it into four categories, but I, I'm going to use Michael Graham's, and we're going to kind of jump off from that. So when we think about Christianity today, what we'll say is that when you meet another Christian, it's a very interesting conversation because there has to be some sort of probing of what kind of Christian are you? Right? Are you like, 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 are you like, you know, what type of Christian are you? And, and there is kind of a siloing of, of grouping around us of kind of Christians who have similar belief systems. Right? So, previous to this, it was like Christian was this label, but it's no longer the case anymore. There's like subcategories of Christian, and that kind of gets interesting. So, let's go back to and answer this question uh, or ask the question Are you an authentic Christian? Are you an authentic Christian? And again, can you even ask that question and can you define this? Well, I think you can. I think it's going to make people uncomfortable, but I still think you can. So let's look at the, uh, the next religions or um, cults or subcategories. I don't even know how to uh, describe this one. Um, Christianity is best understood and defined by our approach to biblical interpretation and application. So with the six categories that Michael Graham uh, really set up for us is that really there are six ways According to Michael Graham, I would, I would say four, but on how we look at the Bible. So what's interesting is the Bible is no longer this document, this sacred document, that we can look at and all agree on. Everybody comes at it now with some uh, presuppositions or some filters. And, you know, it's interesting that, um, you know, within Christianity, uh, there is like a, a great deal of... of uh, hmm. How do I say this in a nice way? Uh, a great deal of um, fluidity. There we go. Fluidity of interpretation. You know? So we would say, you know, oh, this is what the Bible says. But someone else goes, well, does it though? I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. I never thought about that one. So this idea of biblical interpretation is really what kind of sets us apart in regards to how we look at, 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 uh, at our faith. Now, the two categories we're going to look at this morning, the two other religions are not really religions, but they're actually kind of exactly what uh, Michael Graham and Timothy Dalrymple are saying, is that this is what Christianity looks like today. So the two things we're going to look at this morning is on the one side, we're going to look at this idea of what a progressive Christianity might be. But on the other side, we're going to look at another one called the New Apostolic Reformation. Now, the one side, the progressive, you've heard of because I've taught on this before. The other side, you may not have heard of, but you have. You just didn't know it. And actually, believe it or not, the New Apostolic Reformation, it's actually my tribe. It's actually my background, or some of those of you who might be recovering Pentecostals might actually fall into this category as well, too. But we're going to get to that. So let's take a look at progressive Christianity, and let's take a look at what they believe. Uh, I took this off of a uh, website. Uh, I'm just going to put progressive church because I don't want to label which church this is from. But I think this is kind of a really great uh, 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 definition of what progressive Christianity could look like. And this is on their About Us part of it. It says this, in keeping with our reformed and reforming identity, we have embraced a movement that began in 2006 called Progressive Christianity. The movement was a part of a large movement called the Emerging Church. At the heart of these movements was the desire to articulate a way of being Christian that was an alternative to the Christian faith portrayed in the public realm. The leaders of progressive Christianity had grown weary of defining the Christian faith in negative terms. We aren't fundamentalists. We don't believe the Bible is inerrant or infallible word of God. We don't agree that creationism should replace the science of evolution in public schools. We don't believe that God hates gays. We don't believe that people of other faiths are going to hell unless they convert to Christianity. We don't deny the, the right of women to choose what happens to their bodies. Now, within this is actually a really good kind of a broad strokes as far as what progressive Christianity is. It is basically the idea that we don't look at the Bible in the same way that we used to. In other words, we're looking at it with different filters. Now, what filters might that be? In my opinion, one of the best people who has actually studied this is a woman by the name of Alyssa Childers. I've spoken about her before. She has a fantastic podcast, and if you are not listening to Alyssa Childers' podcast, I recommend you do. She is very, very smart, but she is also has great interviews with some really smart people as well, too. And this is what Alyssa Childers says about this idea of progressive Christianity. One of the main differences between progressive Christianity and historic Christianity is its view of the Bible. 
Historically, Christians have viewed the Bible as a word of God and authoritative for our lives. Progressive Christianity generally abandons these terms, emphasizing personal belief over biblical mandate. So comments you might hear are, the Bible is a human book. I disagree with the Apostle Paul on that issue. The Bible condones immorality, so we are obligated to reject what it says in certain places. The Bible, quote unquote, contains the word of God and others. The idea behind this is that we don't look at the Bible anymore as being authoritative. I remember we talked about this idea of inerrancy, and we said, okay, there's been a great deal of misunderstanding what inerrancy actually means. And so we kind of unpacked that a little bit. But when we look at this idea of progressive Christianity, we have to realize that they have now said to themselves and said, you know, uh, I had this conversation uh, with someone. They said, you know, um, I'm not a Pauline Christian. I said, oh, that's an interesting term. Tell me what that means to you. Right, so like, you know the Apostle Paul, he's 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 a misogynist and he's he's this and I you know I cu- I couldn't agree with them, right? So I don't really think and, and I was like, oh, interesting. Okay, fair enough. I always have to ask people to kind of define terms. Whenever you have the initial conversations, it's a really important thing to do, and it's going to save you a lot of uh, foot and mouth disease later on because you have to understand how to have the conversation just by saying, hey, just tell me what that means for you, or, or how do you understand this? Um, another great one I came across is a, it's a whole progressive website. Uh, it's not really so much a, a, a help group, but uh, I thought, you know, let's get some Canadian content here. So Ginny from Canada asked this question. What Bible translation would you recommend for a progressive? So Ginny is asking, you know, I'm a progressive Christian, so, you know, is it NIV, is it KJV? Like, what would would a progressive Christian read? And Reverend Greta Vosper gave this response. I am fortunate to work with a congregation that challenges me to choose readings for each Sunday that are not from the Bible. We use texts that are off, that offer us the opportunity to explore major issues related to being human. They come from ancient and modern literature, poetry and pop culture, movie scripts and love letters. As long as they are worthy of the people who will receive them and fall within the purposes of our gathering to ground ourselves in the interconnectedness of life, to be guided in our choices by love, and to grow in wisdom, we can read it. It's kind of like that Deepak Chopra uh, um, tweet. It's so vague, it seems spiritual, right? And, and it's kind of like, ah, okay, you know, that, that's fine. But what's important about this, and again, to highlight, because really what I'm going to be looking at with this idea of progressive Christianity is like, okay, so how do they understand the Bible? Now, just to be clear, for those of you who attend UCC, you know that I like to bring into my teachings uh, external sources because I think there's this truth out there as well, too. I have never been a person to shy away from sharing, you know, funny or maybe offensive videos. Uh, I've, I've, ne- I've never shied away from giving you other books and other people to think about. Why? Because I think it's important for us as Christians to have a, a well-rounded um, a view of the world and not so silo within Christianity that we can't understand what other people are saying. But this might be where it kind of goes, uh, like, I, I, don't, I don't know if I would ever use a movie script for uh, a sermon, I, I, maybe Star Wars, I don't know. I, I just, I can't think of, oh, definitely The Muppets Christmas Carol. But uh, apart from that, I, I don't know if I could do that, right? But it, it's interesting to note that, you know, what she's saying is that, you know, on our church on Sunday morning, you know, you know I, I, I'll use whatever document I want. Uh, again, let's go back to Alyssa Childers. She says this, progressives are not just a group of Christians who are changing their minds on social issues and politics. According to the most prominent thought leaders and authors and speakers, they often deny core essential doctrines of faith, which leads them to preach an entirely different gospel. This is an important part here. When you understand progressive Christianity, when you look at their view of the Bible, it's not th- you cannot say that they're actually preaching the Bible anymore as they are preaching an entirely different gospel. So if you said to me, hey, do you have any recipes for this? So actually, in my small group, I shared with them a lentil recipe, uh, what we would call dal. And I said, hey, this is actually a really good lentil recipe. You can use it. But if someone came to me and goes, you know what? I want a great lentil recipe, but I don't like lentils. So I'm going to substitute lentils with pasta. Okay, you want a spaghetti? That's fine. That, that's great, right? But is this even a lentil? Is this even you know a lentil soup anymore? If you take the lentils out, right? So if you uh, remove a core ingredient of what is supposed to be given, is it even the thing anymore? You know, it's an interesting question. According to progressive Christianity, revelation is still unfolding. Beliefs and behaviors can be modified today. 
So some of the uh, people who are prominent thinkers within this movement, Richard Rohr, R Rachel Hal Evans, James Berkelow, Brian McLaren, I could put Pete Enns in here, I could have put uh, Jen Hatmaker, and other people who annoy me and irritate me. But again, all individuals have the same idea, and the idea is simply this. The Bible is a sacred document. The Bible was a sacred document. The Bible has parts of sacredness within it, but other parts not so much. Now, please understand something. I have no problem with somebody saying to me, I don't understand about this in the Bible. You know, in, my, in our small group on Thursdays, uh, we, ha we say things like this all the time. Like, we went through the book of Obadiah. Now, when I say the book of Obadiah, it's just, it's just like, it's just like, it's a few verses, right? It's not a lot, right? But we're like tripping over words and, and places and all that. And it would be, it would be foolish for us to go, oh, I know, I completely understand exactly what the prophet Obadiah is saying. So when we say to ourselves, uh, hey, I don't understand completely, there's nothing wrong with that. It's an altogether different thing to say, well, you know, prophet Obadiah, what he was really talking about was this. Because then you have to connect it to the actual text. So all of these individuals, all these thought leaders within progressive Christianity, they have a very different way of looking at the Bible. We, I've taught on this before, so I'm not going to go any further. Now, the group I'm going to come to next is the group that you would not suspect. The next group is what's called the NRA, not, not NRA, NAR. Wow, that was, a, that was a slip there, right? The NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation. Now, again, most of you, I don't think I've ever heard of this group. But as we're going to go through this, you have definitely heard of this group. Okay, so let's, uh, let's unpack the New Apostolic Reformation. Or, NAR is a religious movement that emphasizes experience over scripture, mysticism over doctrine, and modern-day apostles over the plain text of the Bible. Of particular distinction in the New Apostolic Reformation are the role of power and spiritual leaders and miracle workers, the reception of new revelations from God, an overemphasis on spiritual warfare, and a pursuit of cultural and political control in society. The, the seeking of signs and wonders in the NAR is accompanied by blatantly false doctrine. The New Apostolic Reformation is a dominionist movement which asserts that God is restoring the lost offices of church governance, namely the offices of prophets and apostles. Pause right there for a second. There has been popping up lately, as I, as I uh, so I get the opportunity, uh, and I'm always grateful for it, to speak in different contexts. What has been interesting to me is I've been running into more apostles. I'm like, oh, I don't know if there was a factory that was churning these puppies out, but apparently they're out there, right? Or I, I, had, I had an individual. I met them, I said, oh, hi, uh, you know, and I, I said their name, oh, no, no, I'm prophet, and then they gave me their name. I'm like, oh, okay. Is that P-R-O-F-I-T or P-R-O-F-E-P-H-T? I, I just need to make sure I, I, I have the understanding of that, right? I, I didn't say that. I think these things. You're lucky I don't say them, right? And that's why I don't have Twitter. I'd get myself in trouble. But the point is that this is popping up all over the place. Prophets and apostles are actual offices within the NAR movement that believe that they actually have authority to speak in these type of things. And when I say dominionist, what that simply means is that the NAR philosophy isn't just about um, existing within culture. The NAR wants to then um, dictate culture and politics as well, too. Um, growth in the new ap apostolic reformation is driven primarily through small groups and church planning. Me being a church planner, when I go to church planning conferences, that's where I meet these people. Often completely independent of a parent congregation. The movement is not centrally controlled, and many of its followers will not self-identify as a part or even recognize the name. All the same, thousands of churches and millions of believers adhere to the teachings of the New Apostolic Reformation. Popular teachers associated with the New Apostolic Reformation include Bill Johnson, Bill Johnson Rick Joyner, Kim Clement, and Lou Engel. Some of those names might be familiar to you, but we're going we're to go even, uh, even deeper because Canada has a part in this as well, too, because we bear a, 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 a badge of honor in this, in this whole movement. So it's interesting about the NAR is that s most people wouldn't even know who this is. If I said to you, hey, do you know what the NAR is? You're like, I don't know what that is. And I say, do you know what the New Apostolic Reformation is? You're like, I don't know what that is either. Fair enough. Because just so you know, there's no denomination, no head office, no church, no uh, n none of this. So where am I pulling this from? Like, why am I going on this fictitious uh, movement? Because 
it actually has a lot uh, deeper implications. The movement crystallized in the wake of the 1994 Toronto Revival after John Wimber asked John and Carol Arnott to remove their church from the Vineyard Association. While the Toronto Revival was an important catalyst, NAR's roots go back to the Latter Rain Movement in the late 1940s, which first began to talk about charismatic gifts through the laying on of hands and the restoration of apostles and prophets in Ephesians 4. Pause there. Whenever you hear the phrase fivefold, uh, fivefold uh, ministry, Fivefold ministry is your first indicator that the individual and or church believes in NAR. Now, what's fivefold ministry? Great question. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says things something like, uh, in, uh, there have been apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. Right? And so the fivefold ministry is like, everybody in the church, you are one of these five. You go, oh, okay. I'm one of the five. And then there's all these gifts tests. You guys know how much I love gifts tests, right? Uh, hey, take this test, and we're going to tell you which one of these are. You fall into this category. Okay? So the NAR takes this idea, takes this belief, and says, you know what? This is how, this should be the foundation of church leadership within the church. And you kind of go, oh, it's from Ephesians 4. It's from the Bible, so it must be true, right? It is said to be promoted by Trinity Broad Broadcasting Network, Daystar Television, God TV, Charisma Magazine, International House of Prayer, which, by the way, is not to be you know, replaced with International House of Pancakes, and Youth with, a wish Youth with a Mission, yes, YWAM. Popular leaders are said to be Bill Johnson, Bethel Church, we're going to get to that, Mike Bickley, Randy Clark, Todd Bentley, Bill Hammond, and the late Fuller Pro Seminary Professor C. Peter Wagner. Now, this is where things are going to get fun here. Because... At UCC, I don't just talk in abstractions, I name names for the most part. So one of the prominent uh, mo uh, thinkers in the NAR movement is a guy by the name of Bill Johnson of Bethel Church. Now, you may not know Bethel Church, but you definitely know their music, and you've definitely been to their one of their Christian concerts, and we've definitely sung their songs here. <gasps> Relax. But what's interesting is Bethel Church is one of the leading voices within the NAR movement. Many churches, while I may not call themselves Bethel Church, will, s will use language, will use ideas from Bethel Church. I'm picking on Bethel Church, but I could as easily pick on Hillsong. Oh, wait a minute. Not the happy Australians. We like them. Yeah, it, remember, Australia was a penal colony before it came to anything else. So. And everything there is trying to kill you as well, too, right? When you have spiders that attack birds, you know you should not live in that country. Anyways, so Beth uh, Bethel Church is the leading voice within NAR movement. Remember I said to you, you've never heard of the NAR movement. You've never heard of the N and New Ap Apostolic Reformation. But you've definitely heard of Bethel Church. And you've definitely sung one of those songs. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, well, wait a minute here. Just because this, is, you know, this church adheres to this, we're going we're gonna to unpack it a little bit. I'm not going to go too, down, too far down the rabbit hole because this rabbit hole goes way, way, way far down. But just so you know, Bethel Church is not just a good church. It is a money-making machine. They make millions upon millions of dollars, as does Hillsong. Fun fact. If you take a look at uh, the charitable filings of Hillsong and our Bethel Church, their annual revenue, so the best records I could, able, I could find for Bethel Church, because after... Uh, 2016, they suddenly disappear because they reorganize themselves, and that's fine. But as of 2016, Bethel Church was hitting between $46 million and $52 million per year based upon revenue. Hillsong, it's about three times that. Just to let you know. So these are not small voices in the NRA movement. This is not a kind of backwoods, you know, like, oh, yeah, this is Appalachian Christians. They're, 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 you know, they're, handling, uh, they're handling snakes, right? You know, it's not that. This group of churches, Bethel and Hillsong, I would say to you, between Bethel, Hillsong, and let's throw an Elevation in there, although Elevation is not part of the NAR movement, just to be clear. I want to make sure you're hearing me very clearly on that. They have other issues. That's not my problem here. But of these three churches, most churches will choose one of these three to model their church after. Most. Okay? Now, within the Bethel idea is distinctive NAR pr uh, practices, such as a sozo session. Now, what's a sozo session? Good question, because I had to ask myself, what the heck is a sozo session? Sozo session is a spiritual counseling healing 
session where you will go if you feel you have um, issues within your life and you will sit with a spiritual counselor and by the power of the Holy Spirit and, and in prayer, you will confront, meet, uh, and by the way, you can look this all up. I'm like, I, I was going to show you the website. And it, it, it's just, just too much. But simply put, it's a, it's a spiritual counseling that doesn't use any kind of counseling counseling, but just uses like, you know, prayer counseling to be able to kind of walk through it, people with uh, different issues. Now, I try as much as possible to, <laughs> I know this sounds kind of hard to believe, but I, I, I see this. I kind of, okay, I see the intent behind it. Now, the intent behind it, I hope, was that within the body of Christ, we can bear one another's burdens. And sometimes that means just, you know, just let's have a conversation. Let's talk and let's pray together. I, I'm a big fan of that, big proponent of that. What I'm not a proponent for or of is when um, we think that we can use this just simply to replace other issues that some people would need to see a counselor, a therapist, a psychologist, whatever it might be. I am not one of those individuals who are like, oh, no, no, no. I, I routinely use these individuals, uh, like professionals, to help people because I think it's really important. So this idea is a, what's called, that's what a social session is. Um, a healing room. Have you ever heard the f phrase healing room? This is an NAR uh, idea. NAR churches offer courses that train people to prophesy or learn to work, to work other types of miracles. Some NAR churches have even started their own schools of supernatural ministry utilizing curriculum developed by Bethel Church in Redding, California. If you hear a church saying, I hear, we have a healing room, we have this room, we have this type of thing, or we have a school of ministry that's going to teach you how to manifest and work in these gifts of spirit. Just to be clear, Again, no spoilers here. Uh, the Bible doesn't really talk that way. Doesn't really, doesn't really talk that way. So this would be a kind of a, a different way of looking at it. Um, Holly Pivik and Dove, uh, Doug, uh, I can't remember, I don't know how to say his last name, Givet, um, wrote a book on this called Counterfeit Kingdom. And by the way, oh wait, uh, oh sorry, I'm a, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. I apologize when I get excited. Uh, a book called Counterfeit Kingdom. I'd recommend you get it if you really want to, because they go through and they really, like, like, just, they go down the rabbit hole, which I have not done. But this is what they say in the book. The core NAR teaching is that the, mo is, is that the church must be governed by present-day apostles and prophets. The key word in that definition is governed. By governed, NAR leaders mean that apostles and prophets must hold formal authoritative offices in church government. This definition has two major, uh, uh, two important corollaries. Color the first, these apostles and prophets claim extraordinary authority, authority, and they claim to bring new revelation the church needs to advance God's kingdom. This is the point we're going to look at. Within the NAR movement, there is this belief that we can have new revelation. So those of you who know anything about the Toronto Revival or Toronto Vineyard or Airport Vineyard or whatever the term might, term might be, I might be the only Pentecostal who never went. But when I was in uh, Bible college, this was going on. And student after student after faculty went to this. And they would come back with these incredible stories. But what was really alarming was not so much that people were going here to see this, but the things that were happening there that people were going, oh, yeah. like, uh, And again, not to go too down. Again, man, this is my tribe, right? So I get to kind of have a bit more of a horrified feeling about it. But um, people were saying things like, oh, yeah, there's, you know, gold filling, gold dust in your hair, uh, lions roaring, and, and all these other type of things. And you're like, huh, okay, oh, uh, okay. And, and people were talking about this as if this was biblical. I was, I was shocked, and, and, and this actually caused a great division within Pentecostal circles and amongst charismatics because, for the one part, Pentecostals thought they owned the Holy Spirit, so this was kind of a shocker for them that somebody else had it. And, but the second part, though, is then this brought up the question, of what's the role of the Holy Spirit? This is one of the ri reasons why at UCC I've taught you many times how to understand the Holy Spirit and, and what his role is in our lives. And I've always used uh, Scripture to define that role. Now, what's interesting about this idea of the NAR is that it comes at a time where, especially from the 1940s, the latter rain movement, when Christianity could be considered very boring, dry, lifeless, liturgical, you know, right? And so the, uh, the uh, latter rain movement in the 1940s emerges out of that. 
the Azusa Street Revival uh, in the 1905 in, uh, in California, and again, other type as well too. So f many of you may have seen in, in, if you subscribe to anything Christian, this uh, thing that's going on in, in, in Osbury uh, Seminary right now, this, this revival that's taking place there. Just a quick note, people use the word revival, probably should look up what it means. Revival is when non-Christians become saved. That's a revival. Renewal is when Christians have a renewed sense of mission. So I hear people talk about what's going on in, in Osbury right now. And again, it, it's Pensacola. It, it, it pops up all over the place. Please let me hear me very clearly. What's happening there? Fantastic. Great. Right? I, like, like a worship service that continues on? No problem. But when people flock there and say, hey, we need to have this at our church. Or we need to have this happening here. Or this is, and then that's when it kind of gets interesting. And then, and then, it's when the worship service just continues to go on and nothing actually changes within the community around it. It's like, like if, if God fills you with his presence, shouldn't you then want to, you know, go love the others, right? People who are perhaps, you know, not really uncertain about this. And so that's just, you know, Little, little thing there. So Bill Johnson is probably the leading voice within this. Bill Johnson, uh, pastor of uh, Bethel Church. Let's take a look what Bill Johnson thinks about Revelation. Because Bill Johnson is going to let slip really the ideas behind NAR. And these are direct quotes from his books. So in his book, The Supernatural Power of a Transformed Mind, he says this. I am convinced that the pace of Revelation will increase very rapidly in these last hours of history. That acceleration of Revelation is beginning in our day. It's about the purposes of God being unveiled on the planet. Ongoing Revelation and encounters with the power of God launch us into understanding of things we've never understood before. So what's interesting about this is, first of all, um, if this was a bingo card. Every time you use the word Revelation, you get to kind of have a bingo part there. But... Bill Johnson and his teachings, and again, you have to kind of take a lot of his teachings to kind of understand what he's saying, because I have talked about Revelation. And remember I said to you, my definition of Revelation, when the head and the heart agree on the things of God. That's, re that's, that's, uh, that's when Revelation, I think, you read Scripture and all of a sudden it makes sense to you. Like, yeah, okay. But whenever I've talked about Revelation, it's always grounded upon a deeper understanding of, of what the Bible is saying. What Bill Johnson is talking about, and we're going to look at more stuff, is that it's not just about what the Bible. It's actually, you know, uh, when I grew up in a Pentecostal church, there was a phrase they used to say, God is doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing. And I always used to think to myself, why is he doing a new thing? Because we haven't got the old thing right yet. Right? Like, if we get the old thing right, then do the new thing. But if we, hadn't, we can't get the old thing right, let's not do the new thing. Right? Because it just, se it just seems as if there might be, we, we, we might be missing some steps here. Right? And so this idea of new revelation continues to pop up in the NRA movement. There are vast resources of revelation in heaven for the areas of education and business, the arts, and music. And these resources have yet to be tapped anywhere near to their fullness. Our job is to tap the revelation of the Lord in the area of talent or gifting so that we can accurately and uh, powerfully reflect the kingdom, the king and his kingdom. Again, the anointing on a coming generation will be great enough that natural order of things will no longer apply. With a low-grade anointing and revelation, we have to live by natural principles and restrictions to get spiritual results. But Jesus brings this revelation, which is almost frightening. I agree with him on that part. He says, lift up your eyes, meaning with the way you see things right now, you cannot operate on the revelation I want to give you. But there is something available for a coming generation where the anointing is so extreme that every person will be ready for the harvest. Pause. Anointing. It's a fantastic word used all over the place, but on the NAR movement, it's this idea that you have a special knowledge. Oh, if you had the anointing, you would know. You would know. You know the secret handshake. Y you would know. Revelation comes piece by piece, layer upon layer, to generation after generation. So let's go back to this, this chart here. Now, what I had uh, when I started this kind of research into this, I had an aha moment. Because honestly, if I said to you the Charismatics or, or the Pentecostals or, or the, again, not, clinical, not classical Pentecostals, neo-Pentecostals, if I said to you, what does progressive Christianity and this group have in common? Your response would be nothing. And I would I agree with you on that. But I have found something kind of interesting. So for progressive Christianity, they would say the Bible is an incomplete revelation. Well, the NAR would say there is new revelation. But both rely upon the same idea of experience. This is the aha moment that I had. I was like, oh, 
interesting, right? Because when you follow, remember, every idea is a hypothesis. Let's extrapolate it from there. Progressive Christianity would say to you, well, the Bible, don't take it literally. And again, I understand some of that part as well, too, because I have said to you before, when you're reading the book of Revelation, when you're reading some of the prophets, they are writing in Jewish apocalyptic literature. It's metaphor. It's poetry. So there is that understanding when you try to interpret it. But that does not mean that you go, well, you know what, because I don't understand it, I'm going gonna, gonna to ignore it. But on the other side, the neo-charismatics, the NAR, however you want to classify them. And again, most people have never heard of the NAR. Churches, I was going to show you some churches in the area that would use some of this language, and I didn't. You know why? I like to play nicely with people. I don't, but I just forget, you know what? It doesn't matter. The point simply is, is that with the NAR, whenever experience is superior to Scripture, that's a warning sign. Now, I want you to know something. I want you all, I want myself to experience God. I do. And not just in a cognitive sense. I want, I, I, I want my full, my full, <laughs> the fullness of me, uh, my, my, my heart, my mind, my spirit. I want all three to experience God. Because I see it clearly in Scripture. But I do not want you to think that your experience is superior to Scripture. Do you see the difference? So what I found very interesting about these two movements, which again, seem very opposite, they actually had this very common piece of it, and that is their experience. And their experience either says, well, the Bible's incomplete, or I'm going to add to the Bible. And it's like, hmm, I'm not really sure that's what it's supposed to be. So let's answer this question. And again, um, you may not like my answer, but it, again, for the series, I told you that I'm going to try as much as possible to not allow us to escape the, let's test these theories, let's test these ideas. So let's first ask ourselves, what does the word authentic mean? Webster's Dictionary gives us a great definition. This is this, conforming to an original so as to reproduce essential features. Now, this is important to me because one of the things um, I think is really important for Christians is that we don't get to say, hey, this is what the Bible says, unless the Bible actually says it. We don't get to live our lives in any way that is contrary to the Bible if we think the Bible to be true. So, funny story. Uh, an in a person asked me, hey, so what are you speaking on Sunday? They asked. I told them. Oh, well, our church doesn't look at the Bible that way. Interesting. Tell me more. Right, again, I'm always curious. And, you know, as he started kind of unpacking, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I got it. He goes, so, so what are you going to say? And that's what the conversation got uncomfortable. I was like, oh, well, I'm just going to say this, that, you know, the Bible, whatever it is, however you approach it, first you have to look at it and just take its claims. And then from there, you get to do what you want. I, I, I did give this individual a way out because I, 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 I'm not here to say to them, oh, hey, by the way, you're not even a Christian if you take all these parts of the Bible out. Right? Like, you, you self-edit the Bible. If you start going, oh, well, you know what? I don't use a highlight anymore. I use a Sharpie to put, you know, block out the parts I don't like. That could be a problem. So my, here's how I came up with the answer. It, it may be unsatisfactory to you, but I'll, I'll learn to live with that. It says this. This is what I say. To be an authentic Christian is to first take seriously our sacred documents. Remember, I didn't call it the Bible. Because what I've been doing throughout the series is I've been looking at sacred documents saying, do they stand up? Historically? scientifically, do they actually stand up, right? Then, we need to wrestle with the claims. Now, here's why I say wrestle. Because I don't believe that any human being on the planet has ever gotten everything 100% correct, except for Jesus. Right? I, I don't believe anybody has. I love what Rich Mullen says. Only God is right. The rest of us are just guessing. I like that. You know why? Because it, it gives me space to be human. So we wrestle with his claims, and finally, apply these claims to every aspect of life. Now, why is this part important? Well, I think Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, somebody I only understand maybe a quarter of what he writes, but in this particular quote, I think he's absolutely correct. He says this, 
The Bible is very easy to understand, but we as Christians are a bunch of scheming swindlers. I don't know what the Danish version of this is, but I really want to find out. We pretend to be unable to understand it because we know very well the minute we understand it, we are obliged to act accordingly. See, I think Kierkegaard is absolutely correct in this. See, what I think is happening is that we want to live our lives the way we want to live our lives. But the problem for us as Christians or self-proclaimed Christians is this thing that inhibits or stands in our way is the Bible. And so what we have to do ultimately is we have to begin to modify and change it so that we are able to do whatever we want. So we, we de-emphasize this part, we overemphasize this part. Right? Well, I, I don't really believe in the, new t- the, the Old Testament. That, you know, I, I'm going to unhitch myself from the Old Testament. I'm a red-letter Christian. I take the red letter out. You know, I'm not a, I don't, Paul, you know, he's this, he's that, right? So we, we, we self-edit and we go, well, you know. But, um, but at the end of it, what we have is a Christianity that is palatable to us so that we can live however we want anyways. And that's the, the, the part that's really terrifying to me in regards to Christianity. And just so you know, we are, as, as Uptown Community Church, we are part of the Alliance, the Christian Missionary Alliance. Fun fact, the Alliance starts at the Azusa Street Revival as well, too. A.B. Simpson, but he has a different way of approaching the uh, revival that took place there. Pentecostalism goes one way, and he goes a different way with it. Now, you can argue which, w- which way is correct, not important to me. But even in the alliance, I'm seeing NAR ideas pop up. Not from the head office, not from the district office, but from pastors. I had a pastor inviting me to a supernatural school of ministry. I said, no thanks. Right? And I, but I did ask, well, what are you going to teach? Well, we're going to teach you how to prophesy and, and use you know, prophecy as spiritual warfare. We're going to teach you how to... I'm like, oh, okay. I, I understand where you're coming from. No thanks. Right? This is popping up everywhere. Right? Because at some point in time, we've said, we've said to ourselves, well, the Bible's boring. I know the stories of David and Mary and Joseph, and I know Jesus. That's all boring now. We need something new. We need a new revelation. We need a fresh revelation. And so with that, what we do is what you know, Paul talks about in the book of Galatians. It's the Jesus and. Right? What does Paul say to the church in Galatia? How quickly are you leaving the gospel for another gospel? Well, that's what we're doing today. And just so you know, the gospel doesn't have to be progressive Christianity. The gospel doesn't have to be the NAR uh, uh, hyper-charismatic part. The gospel can be, well, look how we're entertaining you. Look how great we are at entertaining you as well, too. The gospel is what, is what we think it should be to attract people to our churches. But that's not what the gospel of Scripture is. The gospel of Scripture, and we'll talk a little bit as we wrap up next week, is this confrontation that has to happen. See, I think Christians have felt embarrassed by Christianity in the sense of like, well, I don't want to tell, say to people that someone of another religion is, is, is not going to experience eternity with God. I don't want to say to a person who has chosen to live their life this way or has chosen this decision, I, I, I don't want to say that. I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to be the meanie. And I, I, listen, I understand that. But when we start asking these questions and we start having these conversations, are we really taking the Bible seriously? Are we actually taking the claims of the Bible seriously? And that's the interesting question that I think we need to really wrestle with. Let me wrap up. Um, There's a very famous passage in 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 5. You know the first part, right? When this is Paul uh, talking to his apprentice, Timothy, he says this. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will, be very di- there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that, right? They will, they will embrace, you know, uh, spirituality, but deny the power behind that. But what I love about this, though, is verse 10. Look what he says in verse 10. But you, Timothy, you certainly know what I teach and how I live. Pause. What's Paul doing here for a second? He's saying it's not just simply about how I live. 
my behavior, but it's also part of my beliefs as well too. What I teach, what I think, the worldview that I have, and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. We as Christ followers, we are navigating this world, this culture, this society, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to navigate it in such a way so that we're not trying to be um, inflammatory or, or um, whatever other terms you want to apply to it. And because of that, there's a, there's, there's a profound insecurity within us that says, well, I, I don't want to say this. I don't want to be this. I don't want to uh, represent this. And I please understand, I understand that. I'm going to show you next week how we kind of navigate in a way that is authentic to Scripture and to Jesus. Yes, you have to come back next week. But what's really important to me is not so much about how people think of me, but it's what I think of God as represented in Scripture. See, I don't believe we have been given anything else on this planet that points us to the way of God and salvation except for the Bible. But again, next week, everything that I've done to the other documents, how we've looked at them, we've parsed them, we've broken them down, I'm going to do the Bible. I'm going to do this to the Bible. We have to. We, just, we can't give a pass to our sacred document. We can't give a pass to Christianity. We have to, be, we have to acknowledge, and, and again, I've tried as much as possible to be as brutally honest in this series. But we have to ask ourselves, if this is true, and again, that's a big if, if this is true, then what's my response? And that's the part that we have to always recognize and wrestle with, right? We have to make sure that what we believe and how we behave is in alignment. We have not been given the choice to say, well, I'm going to reject this part of the Bible. I like this part. I love loving Jesus. He's like Mr. Rogers. I like that, right? But I don't like this God. I don't like the bloodthirsty God of the Old Testament. I, I don't like that one, but I do like this one. So I'm not going to ignore this. I'm going to take this. That happens all the time. I have these conversations all the time. I hope as much as possible, and I don't know if I'm successful with this, I try as much as possible at UCC to teach you in such a way that balances out all these tensions. <laughs> That's why I talk so long. Because believe it or not, I have these voices in my head. Not, I need to see a psychologist's voices in my head. But I have these voices in my head. I actually, I wrote this down in my phone uh, because I was actually wrestling with this. Because I actually, believe it or not, I'm self-aware enough to know that um, longer sermons are not really in fat anymore. 20 minutes, you want to hit the, hit the highlights, 20 minutes, have you out of the door, right? And that's how you grow a church, by the way. Not, not, not this way. So this is what I have in my head. This is actually, I, I, I keep a journal of, of ideas like I don't know what to do with, right? So I wrote this down. It says this. There are skeptics. How do I convince them? There are people who grew up in the church. How do I reawaken them? And there are those who are hostile. How do I help them see faith in a different light? So whenever I speak, whenever I preach, I have three groups of people in my head. It's a skeptic. Really? Jesus, God, been there, done that. I have Christians who grew up in the church. How do I help you to understand that there's still more truth, more depth in the Bible to be mined? And then I have those who are hostile. Those are like, you know what, I don't, I don't care what you say I do. I don't believe. Those three groups are at our church every Sunday. Those three groups are watching our, listening to our stuff online. I asked, um, I asked Mitchell, I said, hey, so like, what's our online stats at? And he's like, oh, this is what it is. I'm like, oh, okay. Apparently people are listening or, and watching. Fair enough, right? Those are the three groups I'm trying to speak to because I realize those three groups are in this room. Those three groups are uh, people I encounter every, on a daily basis. If someone says to me, I don't believe the Bible, fine. But if someone ha comes to me, which has happened, again, I don't believe in coincidences anymore. If someone says to me, like, I, I, this has happened in my life. I'm just I'm having a hard time understanding meaning, or searching for meaning or purpose. That's a great conversation. Let's talk about that. We have to really understand and realize, and I know you all do, we are living in difficult times. We're living in difficult ways to navigate. 
whether at work or at school, friends with family, even uh, like people you're in a relationship with. I, let's please understand, I understand that. One of the reasons why I've been doing what I've been doing as far as getting out into the world to have these conversations because I want these conversations with people. I want people to know. I want people to know that I'm a pastor. I want people to know that I believe there is a God. I want them to kind of test that theory with me. But not just with what I say, but how I live. I want them to know that Christ in me, the Holy Spirit alive in me, it, it's got to make a difference. Because if it doesn't, then what's the point? What's the point? That's why I've been going out and, you know, having working in different places, because I want to have these conversations. It's, it's important to me to be able to test the hypothesis that Jesus is sufficient. Like, like, like I said this uh, a couple weeks ago, if Jesus isn't your everything, then the enemy will provide a fake substitute for you and you will take it. If you believe that Jesus doesn't fill every area of your life, from your relationships, to your thought life, to your finances, to your free time, to your uh, friendships, relationships, if you don't think Jesus is, like, like, like all of it fits in the completeness of Christ, then the enemy is going to show you a way to kind of like to circumvent it. He's going to show you how to, what Kierkegaard says. Ah, you know, you don't have to take that part of the Bible so seriously. This series, believe it or not, has been how do we as Christ followers recognize, understand the world. But I'm hoping in next week we're going to really, <coughs> I'm going to slam dunk this one home. Yes, a five foot five man is going to slam dunk something home. I'm going to show you why the Bible is, not in my opinion, it's the most beautiful, historically accurate, reliable sacred document in the history of the world. And it is worthy of your study, your scrutiny, your anger, your sorrow, your anxiety. It's worthy of all of that. I love what Oliver Wendell Holmes says, truth is tough. The Bible is the toughest of the tough. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Let's pray. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. You know what's going to happen. Don't freak out. I'm not going to make you do anything. This series has been, is an approach of looking at our own faith. I kind of want you to do like a spiritual inventory in the sense of saying, you know what? Have I become passive in my faith? Have I become insecure about who God is and how he's revealed the Bible? And please understand, I understand those insecurities, I understand those uncertainties because I experience them, we all experience them. But I believe that, that God has equipped us through his word to encounter, to confront, to meet whatever the enemy and or the world throws at us. But I believe that we just need to go deeper, deeper and deeper and deeper into the scripture. What I love about the Bible is that the Bible isn't a recipe book to be a good person. The Bible is a series of stories of people who have encountered God. Some behave good, well, some behave really badly. And what I love about the Bible, whenever I read it, I see myself in sometimes the protagonist and sometimes the antagonist, the good person or the bad person. I see myself. And that's what the Bible is. The church needs to capture again that love, that discipline of what the word of God holds for us. You don't need Jesus and. You just need Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have not left us as spiritual orphans. I thank you that the Holy Spirit, you rest within us, you abide within us, and that because of that, we are equipped to encounter the world. It's not that we have dominion or, or we are going to say something and people are going to fall to their knees and say, yes, I accept Jesus. But it's in small ways, maybe even large ways, that we show how our belief in God and our behavior with others is the truest representation, the authentic representation of what a Christ follower is. Lord, I thank you that when we fall, when we fail, and that is often, you forgive us. 
when we ask for it. You cleanse us. You redeem us. You transform us. And Holy Spirit, I am utterly and completely grateful for those moments that I've experienced and we've all experienced. But now, Lord, I pray that we would go out into the world with meekness. Meekness is power under control. Lord, that we would realize, like you who are humble, that we are servants of everyone. We seek to serve in love and compassion and mercy those we encounter. And I just pray, God, that you would use those small moments, those large moments to help us, to help others, to see the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, God, for your word, which is, which is absolute and utter truth. In Jesus' name.